you can see and hear me. Well, I can hear you. I now can't see. Now I can see you as well. So we're fine. Fantastic. Thank you. Mr. Wynne, um, when I was asking questions before lunch about the date of the receipts and payments mismatch bug, um, yes. at the meeting about that, and one of the actions arising from it, namely whose job it was, if anyone's, to inform lawyers in ongoing or past prosecutions and civil proceedings about the bug. Um, uh, can I take, I mentioned a document that I uh, gave the reference to but did not display. Can I um, um, display the document um, for you, please? It's poll 3055410. If we look at the lower email first, please. Um, you'll see that it's from Alan Simpson, and it's dated the 8th of October, 2010. And Alan Simpson, we can see from his signature block, was the Poll Information Security Incident Senior. And you can see that it's to Rob Wilson. Um, Mr. Wilson was the head of criminal law in the criminal law division within post office at the time. Did you um, know that? Did you know, Mr? No, I don't think I came across him at all. Okay. And it helps us on two things, if we can just um, read it. It says, I'm forwarding you the attachments above in relation to a series of incidents. And if we just scroll up, please, we can see that under the attachments, there are two that are mentioned. Um, receipts, payments, <coughs> notes, version 5. Uh, that appears to be a version of the notes that we looked at earlier um, <coughs> concerning a meeting or meetings about the rece receipts and payments mismatch bug. And then lost discrepancies, 29th of September 2010. Um, that appears to be um, Mr. Jenkins' document of the 29th of September 2010 okay. um, that we looked at earlier. So just going back down to the email. I'm forwarding you the attachments above in relation to a series of incidents identify, identified by Fujitsu this week, whereby it appears that when posting discrepancies to the local suspense, these amounts simply disappear at branch level and a balance is shown. Uh, the above includes Fujitsu's initial analysis, that appears to be a reference to Mr Jenkins' documents, and proposed solutions whilst the other documents, the outputs from various meetings held this week, that appears to be a reference, would you agree, to the, um, the note of the meeting that we saw? Yes. It would appear that um, the meetings, plural, were held in the week ending Friday the 8th of October. Do you see that? Yes, I can see that. Uh, my concern is around the proposed solutions, one or more of which may have repercussions in any future prosecution cases and on the integrity of the Horizon online system. So Mr. Um, uh, Simpson is referring the issue to the head of criminal law about future prosecutions based on data produced by Horizon online. Do you remember whether there was any discussion about disclosure of the bug to those conducting current prosecutions uh, based on data produced by Legacy Horizon? Uh, no, I wouldn't be aware of that, no. Can you recall that um, being discussed in the meeting? In this meeting? Yes, or... yes in the meeting that we saw the notes of this morning. Um... Not, not in detail, but I would imagine it would be mentioned, yes. Was this seen as a bug that just afflicted Horizon Online? Uh, as far as I can recall, yes. What exploration was there of whether this was a bug that um, afflicted Legacy Horizon? I wasn't aware of any. Uh, thank you. That can come down. Uh, can we um, move forward, please, to December 2010 and look at 
poll 3029718. Uh, can we start, please, on page eight of this collection? And scroll down, please. And um, this is an um, email from Emma Langfield to a number of people, including you and um, Mr. Jenkins, dated the 24th of December 2010. Can you see that? Yes. And she's asking for help there, as there are some branches for whom um, values appear marooned in the PNBA discrepancy account. If you just um, scroll down, it says, "Morning, please see below from PNBA. They've identified some branches where values appear marooned in the PNBA discrepancy account." Yes. Yes. And that. Um, uh, they either appear not to align to values in the last Fujitsu spreadsheet or have not been identified as part of this issue. And then um, there are a number of emails exchanged as part of this um, uh, collection of emails uh, with ultimately a, um, a response from Mr Jenkins on uh, page one of this collection. And we see this is an email from him to you um, moving forward a number of years to May 2012. And he says, sorry it's taken me lo so long um, to get back to you. Um, I've had a trawl back through my old emails and what I found is the following. And um, he sets out in his paragraphs one, two and three what he's discovered in relation to two branches that were in the original list associated with the loss discrepancy issue that had occurred in 2010. And then in paragraph four, he says, although I, um, I can also see that although a branch number was in the original list, it seems to have dropped off very, I think that's early. This is because it wasn't in the original list from poll and also the precise symptoms in terms of something that left behind were different. I can't find any trace um, of any further investigation of this in my emails. Given the discrepancy amounts in both cases were very large, I'd be surprised if they weren't properly investigated at the time, but they don't seem to be included in the list relating to the something discrepancy investigation. If you want this followed up uh, further, I suggest you raise it with the poll problem management team, Emma Langfield, who can then get the Fujitsu problem management team to dig further. So th this is correspondence um, under two years after the problem was um, discovered. And there appears, would you agree, to have been some doubt as between Fujitsu and poll over which branches had been investigated as prob possibly impacted and which had not. Yes. And at the very least, no shared understanding of what had happened. Yes. H who was responsible for um, investigating and understanding the extent of the problem and updating the branches affected? In terms of the updating the branch, I would probably suggest that that was PNBA. Um, in terms of investigating, I would imagine that would, would be the IT team. But you've got in 2012 here, um, Mr Jenkins saying that according to uh, the documents that he can access, there's a branch um, with a, a very large discrepancy uh, two branches with a very large discrepancy, and they don't seem to be included in the list.
Would you regard that as problematic? Yes. Given the seriousness with which the mismatch bug was taken in uh, back in September, October 2010, we've seen the documents around that. May this suggest that the follow-up on the impact on branches was taken less seriously? I, I can't really say it. Did um, the post office take seriously the need to understand the full impact of this significant issue, and in particular the impact on individual branches and sub-postmasters, and ensure that all affected branches were identified and there was a proper investigation? Yes, as far as I was aware. Can we turn, please, to poll 309-8016? This continues the thread of discussion on the two outstanding queries on the receipts and payments mismatch bug. And we're now ahead to April 2013. Uh, can we go please to page four of the thread to begin it? And at the foot of the page, please. that you will see an email from David Wright, who was, a, I think, an IT service advisor in service management. And it's an email to Andy Dunks and Penny Thomas, Steve Bansell, um, Scott Summerside, yes, and to you. Yes. Um, it, it reads, Andy, and I, I don't think that's you, that's the Andy Dunks that's addressed to, is that right? I would think so, yeah. Um, uh, Andrew Wynn, Relationship Manager, Financial Service Centre, has requested service management assistance in reopening Fujitsu investigations for two outstanding inquiries he has been dealing with for our branches. Um, at our recent service review meeting held with Leighton Matchin, he suggested your names as the appropriate contacts. Gareth Jenkins has also been approached in the past. I've attached some information previously shared via email, but if you need more detail to help you resolve these incidents, please approach Andy Wynn direct, and then they give your um, details. And then if we go up the chain, please, uh, to page three, we'll see that uh, um, a chaser is sent on the 22nd of February. Uh, just scroll down, please. Uh, keep going, please. And keep going. And yes, that's it, 22nd of February. Um, hi, Leighton, I've just picked up a reply from an inquiry I made to Andy Winner now. Finance Service Centre, he's been on leave, and disappointingly, he's not heard anything from the contacts you suggested last month. Can you escalate the inquiry on our behalf? So that's essentially a chaser. Would that be right from um, somebody that worked to you, David Wright? Uh, I think, I, I remember David Vega. I think he might have been working in NBSC at that time, but I'm not sure he wasn't in PNBA. Or finance service centres, it was then. I mean, you can see his signature block there, and he appears to be based in Dern House in Barnsley. All oh, right, yeah, okay. Uh, does that mean he was working for you or not? No. no. Anyway, it's a chaser. And then yes. if we go back to page three, please, at foot of the page, um, another chaser a month later on the, the 5th of March. It's not a month later, it's the following month. Hi, Leighton, were you able to escalate this on our behalf? And then a reply from Fujitsu, apologies, it seems it was not cascaded 
at the point of your last request. I will cascade it now. A response in one form or another will be provided by close of play Thursday. Um, and then up to the bottom of page two, please. Mr. Wright, hi, Leighton. Did a response get issued on Thursday? I've not received it. Did it just go to Andy? And then up to the bottom of page one, please. Thank you, um, Steve Bansell, to a collection of people, including you. Accept my apologies. I thought I'd sent this email um, some uh, weeks ago. And he answers a query about pay station transactions. Do you see that in the, his third paragraph? So yes. to answer the question about pay station transactions, which is something else, yes? And then you reply at the top of the page, if we go to the top of the page, on the 16th of April, 2013. You say, hi, Steve. Um, yes, it does. However, I'm far more concerned about the outstanding query relating to the receipts and payments problem back in 2010, where we have two branches, and you identify them, who appear to be on the initial list of branches, but not on the list of those resolved. We still have a large unexplained credit on one branch, whilst we've recovered money from pay on the other, despite them recording a significant surplus at the time. I need to be clear, there's no unresolved problem in either branch, I'm sorry, in case either branch appears in the ongoing Horizon Integrity Review. I know you've previously stated that a work plan was set up to do some further analysis on one of the branches, but uh, the post office requested this not to proceed, but I need to understand why they disappeared from the resolved um, spreadsheet. And so what you were doing, you were saying that there's an issue that's now two to three years old. Yes. And there are two branches that are maybe affected in different ways, but yes. I want a resolution. Yeah, I, th I think from what I remember is that they were on an initial list, a uh, kind of quite big list at the time, and Fujitsu said these have got an issue, but they're not the same as the receipts and payments, so we need to separate them, if I remember correctly. And for one of them, you've made a deduction. You, the post office have made a deduction from um, the uh, SPM's yes. remuneration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that, that's what it reads there. Yeah. You say I need to be clear there's no unresolved problem in case either branch appears in the ongoing Horizon Integrity Review. Why would you need to be clear that there's no unresolved problem for that purpose, rather than because in one case the sub-postmaster might owe money, and in the other case the sub-postmaster is owed money? Uh, there would be, there'd be no difference between the two. The, the, the issue needs to be resolved. But why was it important in case either branch appears in the ongoing integrity review? We would... Um Wouldn't it be a good enough reason that we've taken some money out of a sub-postmaster's wages, perhaps wrongfully, that I need an answer? I would, I would say any branch that we know has got a problem, we need to resolve it as quickly as possible. But we're two or three years on now. Yes. Was it because the decks needed to be cleared because you didn't want cases like this showing up in the integrity review, as you call it. I don't think it was anything to do with debts. I think it was to do with branches like that shouldn't have issues that need resolving three weeks or no man three years. So the the bug was a significant issue for the uh, post office. Yes, it was discovered in 2010 at some point. W was it causing you some considerable concern, even aside from the integrity review? that by 2013, you still didn't have a clear picture as to who was affected and how? Um, no, because my, my belief was that if there was a, a discrepancy, 
if, if the receipts and payments impacted a branch, then the balancing amount would land in our discrepancy account. And we got the discrepancy accounts cleared down so that we could see any figure that was, because normally in a discrepancy account, you, you do your branch trade and you money going to the discrepancy account, the subpoena would pay it, or we'd repay the support master and that amount of clear down to zero. So basically the account at that kind of time, 2013, was very clean. So being it, if any branch had a receipts and payments mismatch, we would see it eventually, not in a particularly timely manner, but we would start seeing figures rolling forward. Can I turn to a different issue? That document can come down, please. Uh, can we look, um, and this is to do with remote access, um, at poll 3022-3432? Can we look at the second page first, please? And uh, just to explain, the reason I'm asking you these questions um, is because they concern your engagement with sub-postmasters and uh, your knowledge about remote access. So the, the chain starts, and it's only a two-email chain, from Mr. Lusher. Can you see that at the foot of the page? who's a contracts advisor in the network support team in Norwich. Yes. And just explain shortly what uh, that, that role involved. Um, they were responsible for making sure that the um, con contracts were applied to sub-postmasters and forwarded by the sub-postmasters. Um, they, they would be, if I remember right, responsible for signing up any debt recoveries, major debt recoveries. Um, I never really saw a job description, but we, we, we contracts managers, we were regularly, they would be involved in being become aware of debt, and so there would be quite a lot of conversation, communication between contract managers and Thank themselves, you. some more than others. So, and if we go to the top of the page, we can see that it's an email from Mr. Lusher to you um, of the 15th of October, 2008. And he says, hi, Andrew, I spoke to you a few days ago about a suspension at Rivenhall. From our conversation, I believe you had a good understanding of the problem, and I'd be grateful for further guidance. Rivenhall is a one-position rural branch, the only abnormal product being an ATM. I've attached notes of the interview, should you want to refer to them, although they're rather long. There are two issues which the suspended sub-postmaster, Graham Ward, raised. So just some context here, um, stopping at that point. Um, Graham Ward was a, um, a sub-postmaster at that branch, the Rivenhall branch, whose contract was um, terminated, we know, whose appeal against contract termination was dismissed. Um, who became one of the 555 claimants in the group litigation and who is a core participant in this inquiry. Um, his evidence was read to the chairman in the course of the human impact hearings last year. In short, um, he's a sub-postmaster who lost his job, whose marriage broke down, and who was left in debt with four young children. Now, Mr. Lusher encloses the interview transcript and gives a summary. Let's read the, um, uh, the summary together. One, uh, he claims that on a number of occasions, figures have appeared in the checks, the checks line of his account. He suspects these have been input into his account electronically without his knowledge or consent. He is certain that he has cleared and rammed out the checks in the correct way and tells me that checks must be properly cleared on the system to progress to a new account. Just stopping there, can you explain what you understand from what is being described there from Mr Ward's account? 
Uh, what, he, what he's saying is that um, he's seeing checks appear on his check line that he doesn't believe he has taken an input to the horizon system. And what does he seeing checks appearing on his check line mean? Um, you can pull up a check holdings at any point, which will show the values that have been input there. Uh, and that that will be what he what he's seeing. And um, he's saying that he has cleared and rimmed out the checks. And what does he mean by that? So at, at end of day, you would um, well not necessarily at the end of the day when your postman arrives for say four o'clock. Just before then, you will look to see what checks you've got, check them against your check line, make any adjustments if need be, because people will make mistakes of pressing cash like they do every time, so need to introduce a check there. Um, rem out the checks. I can't remember the order of it, but basically you rem out the checks, which means you're dispatching them. Off you've the handed person. the check over. Um, that's what you're telling the system. That wouldn't. You do that at the same time but not precisely the same time and you'd need to clear the check check line check account i.e i've received a check from somebody i've now passed the check on that's right in in the in physically passed the check on yes that's and where it's telling horizon there is a bit and i'm afraid i can't describe it properly but there is two elements to the process one is the re reming out of the checks and the other one is to clear the check check line okay it sounds now it's there was some logic to it, but at the moment I can't okay. explain why I ram out doesn't there. But it did cause problems in terms of you get distracted, you forget and you're doing it, and that can result in checks appearing when you don't expect them to be. And um, what he's saying is that he's certain he's cleared and rammed out the checks. Yes. And yet there are some checks appearing on his check line, which suggests that he's still sitting on checks. Yes. Um, he, paragraph two, he has made good about £10,000 and not made good about £11,000 of the sort it is which arise from these figures. He claims that because of the abnormal nature of these entries, the shortages have not just rolled over from one branch trading statement to the next, but have accumulated, each being added to the last. E.g., if the account in period one showed a shortage of £100, which was not made good, then the uh, shortage shown in period two would be £200. And then just scroll down a little bit, thank you. The sub-postmaster's sub contract remain suspended. I would be very grateful for your expert comment and advice. You would agree that the account summarised by Mr Lusher of what Mr Ward was saying um, was a, a, a clear and coherent one? It appears it, yes. He's saying he's put... £10,000 of his own money in already, but he's not made good another £11,000 of loss. Yes. And he's saying that the system's magnifying the loss even without him doing anything by simply moving from one trading period to the next. Um, well, more than that, doubling up every trading period. It's magnifying doubling up. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, he uses the £100 to £200 example. Yeah. You would agree, I think, that this is a very serious issue being raised? Um, yes, if it's backed up, yes. It's serious for the sub-postmaster, would you agree, because on his account he's lost £10,000 of his own money? Yes? Yeah, well, yes. The system showing that he owes a further £11,000, it's serious for that reason, would yes. you agree? yes. It's serious for him because um, he's been suspended. Yes. And it's serious for him because his contract might be terminated and he would lose his job and his livelihood. Yes. It's serious, would you agree, for the post office? Because if a sub-postmaster is saying that the system that's used across the country has introduced a phantom sum into his um, uh, check line of account, that's very serious. Yes. If it's correct, it's a serious issue with the Horizon system. Yes. Can we turn to your response, please? Uh, page one. Uh, you respond on the 23rd of October. So his email was the 15th. This is the 23rd of October 2008. And you say, um, 
one, the only way poll can impact a branch account remotely is via the transaction correction uh, process. Uh, reading a couple of sentences on. Sorry, um, I'll read the next sentence. They have to be accepted by the branch in the same way that in-out remittances are, I guess. If we were able to do this, the integrity of the system would be flawed. Fujitsu have the ability to impact branch records via the message store, but have extremely rigorous procedures in place to prevent adjustments being made without prior authorization within poll and Fujitsu. Now, in your witness statement, you say that you were aware that Fujitsu had what you describe as remote access, and this is um, email suggesting that you knew by at least 2008, yes? Yeah. And I, I, sorry, I would I would say that my response there was was a, a repetition of a, a question. I, I would imagine from this point, I went to someone in Fujitsu or our, our IT side, asked them that question that Alan had posed, and repeated it back there. I don't think that kind of would have come just from me. Well, I was going to suggest th this first part of paragraph one suggests some familiarity by you with Fujitsu's access controls, doesn't it? Um, as a result of me asking, Alan posed the question, can we get, can, we, can there be remote access? And I will have asked the question based on that question. How had you satisfied yourself as to the security of the Fujitsu access controls? Um, I, I don't think I did. How could you be satisfied that they were being monitored effectively by Fujitsu? I couldn't. We know from um, some evidence that a man called Richard Roll gave in the um, group litigation and indeed from documents disclosed by Fujitsu to us in this inquiry that um, Fujitsu's third line of support um, were... Um, routinely using their ability to go into the system in a way that was described by them as off-piste. Did you know about that? No. That wasn't in accordance with the um, regularisation controls and protocols that were in place? Yeah, I wasn't aware of that. So what um, evidence did you have to believe that Fujitsu were following protocol? Uh, just what I've been told. Who had told you that? I don't know. But you've been told something by the sub-postmaster. Yes. Why did you accept what Fujitsu were telling you rather than what the sub-postmaster was telling you? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I did. I'm not sure what research I did, investigation into the branch. Anyway, you continue. These controls form the core of our court defence if we get to that stage. He makes a casual accusation that is extremely serious to the business. As usual, he should either produce the evidence for this or withdraw the accusation. By saying these controls form the core of our court defense, you were indicating to Mr. Lusher, weren't you, that it was okay to say to Mr. Graham, uh, to Mr. Graham Ward, that the post office was prepared to go all the way here we're willing to stand up in court and defend Horizon and its operation by Fujitsu, won't Yes, you? I think so, yes. You say that Mr... I'm saying that from without any legal background to give me the authority to say that. You say that Mr Ward made a casual accusation. In what respect was it casual? <laughs> he, he didn't pre present any evidence to support his claim. Casual means free and easy, doesn't it? Bad, bad choice of a word, sorry. Sorry? A bad choice of a word at a time. Wordy. Is that what this is? I mean, casual means no, no. without thought, free and easy. Something just falls from the lips without any real thought being given to it. How did you know it was a casual observation, a casual accusation? Well, as I say, I can't, cannot recall what investigation I carried out at the time. That, that, that um, whether you carried out an investigation or not um, doesn't 
uh, tell us why you uh, suggested to Mr. Lusher that this sub postmaster was making a casual accusation, does it? I've already acknowledged that the term casual wasn't well used. You did not know whether it was a casual accusation or not, did you? I'm, I'm sorry, I feel so going around in circles. I, I will have carried out an investigation. I assume I will have carried out an investigation. There's no reference to an investigation in this email by you. OK. Is there? I don't know. I can't see the full email. Uh, have a look at the full email. Can we move it down a little bit? Yes, yes, please do. There's no reference in that to you carrying out an investigation at all, is there? That's correct. So I'll ask again, how did you know that this was a casual accusation by Mr Ward? Re reading that, I should have done an investigation. You say that the accusation, if we just go back up to um, paragraph one, and in the second part of paragraph one, starting these controls, in the second sentence, he makes a casual accusation that is extremely serious to the business. Can you see that? Yes. Why was it extremely serious to the business? Because if, if the accusation was correct, then that would support the lack of integrity into the system. Why was the seriousness of the business seemingly your principal concern rather than the merits of the issue that had been raised by this sub-postmaster? Um, I think the nature of the business, at the state of play within the business at that time with the concern about horizon integrity. This is 2008. This is before computer, okay. the Computer Weekly article had broken. Okay. Was the integrity of the business your principal concern rather than the actual merits of an issue that had been raised by a sub-postmaster? No, I would say that exactly the opposite and uh, I'm not happy about this. You're not happy about? About my actions on this one. You continue... Or lack of action. You, you continue. Um, as usual, he should either produce the evidence for this or withdraw the accusation. This was a sub-postmaster saying that the system was pro uh, introducing phantom figures in his check line. Yes. How could he possibly produce evidence of that? The, you can print pr the checklist in reports. It can be prin printed out. So he, he could have done before and afters with the reming out of checks. So if he'd remed out £100 of checks and then it reappears again then that could, those receipts could be... So why didn't you say that? Just show us these. You're being very combative here, aren't you? He makes a casual accusation that's yes. extremely serious for the business. He should either produce evidence or withdraw it. Yeah, I, w I would agree that this is um, not the kind of letter I would typically write. You seem concerned that he was slandering the business, don't you? Um, not, not really. Produce evidence or withdraw that accusation is what you're saying here, aren't you? Uh, yes. Would you put the reputation of the business ahead of investigating the merits of what was being said by a sub-postmaster? No, that would not be 
the way I would like to think I approached a job. Who had determined that it was for sub-postmasters to prove that what they were saying was true, rather than raising an issue and it being investigated by PMBA? The... I.e. before we'll start an investigation, you've got to prove what you say is true, otherwise we won't start an investigation. Uh, no, no, I think... Um... I think this probably suggests that this was done in the very early days of me taking on the role. Would, you, would that tie up with the dates? I would say that I got significantly better at my job as I gained the experience on doing it, and I'm not happy looking at this. You commence that sentence, as usual, he should. That suggests a stock line. Well, Doesn't yeah, it? the... So... The bulk of what you're looking looking at is disputing transaction corrections. That was, at that time, probably the bulk of my, my work. So if a postman said this transaction correction isn't correct, we'd ask them why they're saying that. So we provided the evidence for the transaction correction. What, what are you producing to suggest that it's not correct? You but I, th I think I would have, if, if this would have been three, four years later, I think I would have dealt with it in a completely different way. Um, in paragraph two, you say what the, quote, the abnormal nature of these entries means. I assume no one knows. He was saying that figures appeared in his check line of account without his knowledge or consent. That's pretty abnormal, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Why were you saying what the, quoting back, to him, um, to Mr. Lusher, the abnormal nature of these entries means I assume no one knows, when it was perfectly obvious that they were abnormal. They were phantom figures appearing in the check line. What, what, why were you taking that point when it was perfectly clear what the sub postmaster was saying? I can't respond to that, sorry. You continue. The implication is that he acknowledges that when he, quote, made good, end quote, at branch trading, he did not and falsified his branch trading statement and rolled the loss forwards. You were being told by Mr Lusher that the sub-postmaster had put £10,000 of his own money in weren't you, in the previous email? Yes. And you here appear to be criticising the sub-postmaster for doing so, saying that he's guilty of falsification. Aren't you? When he made good, i.e. that's putting £10,000 in... I think what I'm saying is he's told Horizon that he's put £10,000 in, but then immediately the... So, so he does his cash declaration at Branch Trading, £10,000 short, he makes good cash 10000 so he balances. Next day, the £10,000 shortage reappears again, which would suggest he's not physically put the £10,000 into the till. That's not what you're saying there at all. You're saying yeah. that um, the system is showing a, um, a £20,000 um, debt on the check line. He um, acknowledges some of that debt when he's made good at branch by putting £10,000 in, and he's therefore falsified his branch trading statement, aren't you? No, I don't think so. I, 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 I mean, we're not talking about the check line anyway here. We're talking about the cash position. So what I'm saying is that the derived cash position was £20,000 that there should be cash. He only physically had 10000 in the till. 
he's, he's then told her he's just, they increased his cash declaration to 20,000. The system has rolled forward in a balanced state, but because the £10,000 didn't, didn't physically go into the till, when he did his next cash declaration, the £10,000 shortage was still there again. Uh, moving on, at uh, um, the foot of the page, um, two paragraphs up, you say, if that doesn't satisfy him, he would need to establish that his trial balance actually balances. If it does, and it will, he would need to demonstrate where the balancing £10,000 element of the loss is. These are all things for him to prove. If he can support any of his allegations, we will investigate and be extremely worried whilst doing so. In the course of these paragraphs, you say, I think four times, that it's down to the sub-postmaster to prove, for the sub-postmaster to establish, for the sub-postmaster to demonstrate for the sub-postmaster to support what he's saying. Was the assumption by you that if there was no obvious answer or cause for a discrepancy, it was assumed to be the fault of the sub-postmaster, unless they proved otherwise? Uh, I think that's probably a fair comment. And therefore, you're applying an approach of assuming that the sub-postmaster is guilty until he proves he's innocent. Um, I don't, I don't, guilty doesn't sound a, a It's not a nice equation. word, is it? No, no. But it's accurate? No, I don't think it is. You assume that I, I, assume, I, I believe that the loss was proper to the branch. I, I think guiltiness is not something that I was cons would, would, would be thinking. You assume that he's culpable for wrongdoing unless... I believe Unless he's he culpable for otherwise. the loss, yes. Unless he can give me any indication not. Where he was saying that the problem is due to an error in Horizon, it's programming, a bug or some such, in the code or in the data, how was he to prove that? Yes, I can't answer that. We've heard evidence from many sub-postmasters that once they were suspended, they were locked out of their offices. You knew that, didn't you? Um, pro probably, but it yeah. wasn't. This sub-postmaster was suspended. If he was locked out of his office, how would he prove it? Yes, fair point. Well, what's the answer to it? I don't know. Is this email a reflection of the fact that it was important for you to maintain the position that Horizon was infallible, was foolproof, and that if he could support any of his allegations, that would unfortunately undermine that position? I think it's a reflection of me being new to a role and not doing it very well at that point. And as I said, if I was doing it a couple of years later, I would have approached it a lot better. So I think I was probably following the company line to some extent at that point. You say at the foot of the page, in the last line, if he can support any of his allegations, we'll investigate and be extremely worried whilst doing so. Is that because it would undermine the um, infallibility of Horizon, the yeah. line that the post office took? Yes, I think um, if, if checks were, phantom checks were appearing on a branch's account, then I would be extremely worried. And I've, I've kind of agonised over that concept for quite, quite a while. And I, I still cannot understand how that would happen, but if it does, it does. Wouldn't it cause an extreme worry that a man suspended from his job about to lose his livelihood, career, and marriage, was in fact innocent of any wrongdoing. Yes. Was the attitude of mind that we see displayed in this email reflective of a culture in which you worked at this time? Possibly. Well, put it another way. If others in your department have been asked to respond to Mr. Lusher's email, <coughs> would they have responded broadly as you did on the key issues or are you the outlier that took a particularly hard line on sub-postmasters? No, I think the former. 
the former. Yes. Can I turn um, to a related email exchange concerning um, Mr. Ward? Poll uh, four zeros, double two six eight. Just forgive me whilst I catch up with my hard copy papers. Can we turn to page two, please? Um, and just scroll down just so we can see the signature block, please. Uh, this is um, an email dated the 1st of February 2010 from Hayley Fowle, External Relations Manager at the Royal Mail Group. And it concerns Mr Ward, the man we've been looking at, and it's to David Smith, Michelle Graves, and Dave Holbert. Uh, hi all, we've had a media in, uh, inquiry from Retail News Agent magazine. They've been talking to a sub-postmaster who has said that his branch was closed in September 2008 because of financial irregularities, which he claims are the fault of Horizon. I'm providing our stock line, which states that the system is robust. But in case we get more questions on this, please can you advise if you have any record of an investigation of this individual and any relevant details, um, Graham Ward, Rivenall, uh, Oak, Stores and Post Office in Witham. And can we go back over the page? Page one, please. And the bottom half of the page, please. Uh, Michelle Graves, the Executive Correspondence Manager for the Executive Correspondence Team, replies, I've been corresponding with Mr Ward for a while. You may recall he's on the spreadsheet I pulled together. I'll send over what I have. The issue is basically the same. Horizon is at fault. And he is focused on some checks dispatched from his branch that uh, I think that's then showed up on his check line. The termination went to appeal and the decision to terminate was upheld. Mr Ward's MP is Brooks Newark, who I believe has raised parliamentary questions re-horizon integrity. Um, Andy, um, I think that's you now copied into this chain, you also asked me for an update on Mr Ward recently. If you have any new info, can you please um, let Haley know? And then um, at the top of the page, you reply, Hi, Haley. We're due to restart our former agent debt recovery process. I just want to um, check the recent communications to ensure there's nothing there to suggest we should not do this. Let me know if we should not pursue at this stage. In this email chain, um, there's a reference to the stock line, a stock line which states that Horizon is robust. Is that something that you were aware of? Yes. Would you agree that a stock line is a standard response, a hackneyed response, yes. to which no real thought or attention has been given? Um, mm, no. Does that um, not reflect, then, your understanding of the use of the phrase stock line? I, I would say... Uh, my understanding is that it's used by everybody, but I don't think it undermines the in integrity behind that belief. You say you wanted to check recent communications um, don't um, suggest that we shouldn't restart the um, debt recovery process. Why would the recent communications affect the restarting of the debt recovery process? I, it depends what the communications have been and whether the business approach had been changed. This was now some time on from your uh, response in 2008 that there would be no further inve investigation by the post office. 
unless um, Mr Ward could prove what he was saying and asserting your confidence in Fujitsu's security procedures. Were you concerned at all that Mr Ward was continuing to protest his innocence and to seek answers about why there had been unexplained entries in his accounts? Um, I, I was conscious that he, he was obviously still protesting his innocence, but uh, I, I wasn't doing anything about it because I, there was nothing I could do about it. Why was there nothing you could do about it? Because I, there would be no access to Horizon information at that point. Why? Uh, you'd have to ask Fujitsu and our IT department that. There's, you can only, could only go back so far. How at that stage could Mr Ward um, establish his innocence? I can't see it. Yes, thank you very much, um, Mr Wynne. Those are the only questions I ask at the moment. So I wonder whether we might take um, a 15-minute break and then um, the questions for the call participants can commence at 3 p.m. Yes, that's fine, yeah. Thank you very much, sir. So thank you. I think uh, Mr. Steen is going to ask questions first. Right. So thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Wynne. My name is Sam Steen. I represent a, a large number of uh, sub-postmasters and mistresses. Um, I'm going to take you back, first of all, to the mismatched document, which I hope I've got the correct uh, reference number to, which is POL 0002838. Now, can we go to page three, please? And Mr. Wynne, you were taken to this document um, earlier on by Mr. Beer, who highlighted with you the various solutions that were discussed on this page. Uh, Frankie, could you highlight solution one, please? In yellow, or oh, thank you. Now, um, let's just remind ourselves of what solution one referred to, Mr. Wynne. Um, solution one was alter the horizon uh, branch figure at the counter to show the discrepancy. Fujitsu would have to manually write an entry value to the local branch account. And then it says impact. When the branch comes to complete next trading period, they would have a discrepancy which they would have to bring to account. Now, under risk. This has significant data integrity concerns and could lead to questions of tampering with the branch system and could generate questions around how the discrepancy was caused. This solution could have moral implications of post office changing branch data without informing the branch. Now, um, you've just been asked before the short break, a few minutes ago, a number of questions about Rivenhill post office and about uh, questions that related to interference with the data that was being seen by the postmaster there, Mr. Wynn, Mr. Ward, yes? Um, at this particular meeting, you're being told it is possible to tamper with branch office accounts, uh, and indeed the conclusion is, as, reg as, as regards that, that that could have moral implications of post office changing branch data without informing the branch. Was this the first time that you'd learnt that Fujitsu could alter branch accounts? Um, I, I don't know. Well, it, it's a fairly significant issue to have come up in this particular meeting, bearing in mind you're dealing with Rivenhall. Do you agree? Yes. Did you, um, as a, an example, did you say to yourself that we'd better do something about Rivenhill uh, because this appears to show that Mr Ward there may be right, that data there could be interfered with without his knowledge? I think what the, there's a difference between entering data to resolve a problem rather than what the implication was from Mr Ward of somebody introducing checks for no apparent reason. I see. Uh, did you in any way investigate the issue that uh, comes from this when you thought about Mr Ward's situation? No. You understand the link, don't you? I, I do now, yes. I probably wouldn't to uh, at that point. I'm going to take another document, please, which is P-O-L triple zeros, five, five, four, one, oh. And 
could you highlight, thank you, uh, further down the page, please, Frankie. And uh, this is a document you were shown um, just after the luncheon adjournment today, um, the one that uh, is dated 8th of October 2010, and Mr Beer took you to this uh, and dealt with um, the particular points. Can I take you to the second paragraph? So this is about the mismatch uh, meeting notes. The above includes Fujitsu's initial analysis and pr proposed solutions. Can we scroll up to the above bit, please, Frankie? Right. So the attachments in relation to this email are the receipts, payments, notes, version 5, which we believe are the mismatch notes that you've been asked a number of questions about. And then after the colon, highlighted there, lost discrepancies, that's a document drafted by Mr Jenkins. Okay? Let's go back to what we were seeing in the middle of this email. You said in your evidence today to the chair of this inquiry that you thought that Fujitsu had proposed the three solutions in the mismatch meeting notes. Yes. Right. Now, this particular uh, email from Alan Simpson, who attended that meeting, is saying the above, the above um, uh, attachments, includes Fujitsu's initial analysis and proposed solutions. Does that uh, help you? in your recollection that it was Fujitsu that had put forward the solutions that you've been taken to today? Um, it supports what we're saying, yeah. Now, as regards those solutions, um, did anybody uh, consider uh, at the meetings in relation to the mismatch um, uh, yeah, bug and software error, did anybody consider the um, legal implications of keeping information back from sub-postmasters being prosecuted? I can't remember that being I mean, discussed now. As an example, did anybody suggest that might be a criminal offence of keeping that information back? No? No. no. Uh, lastly, in relation to this, um, the email is referring to the above includes Fujitsu's initial analysis and proposed solutions, whilst the other documents, the outputs from various meetings held this week. Let's take that apart into two bits. So it looks as though regarding the mismatch discussions that there were various meetings. Does, is that to your recollection? I don't remember attending various meetings. It might, may have been phone conferences rather than meetings. Would it be normal for these meetings to have um, notes taken? Well, somebody would have been responsible, yes, I, I, would, I believe so, yeah. And presumably the end result of such meetings would be notes and minutes? Yes. I'm going to take you, please, to then uh, a different document, which is Pol P O L triple zero two nine two two four, page five. Thank you. And if you can scroll down the page, this, so this document, um, I'm afraid, is is difficult. We might we might be able to improve it by um, expanding it slightly, Frankie. Go further down the page, please. And again, a little bit further down again. Right, and um, you will see at the bottom of that page, if we can highlight from information KI Barnes has called in, can we zero on that and, and expand and highlight? Right. Now, uh, this particular document, as you can see, it's um, uh, 2001, it looks like, and the references is to phantom transactions, okay? Mm -hmm. So, I read what we have here. Um, uh, this is a, a, a record of this matter being dealt with in as, a, as a, a peak, which is part of the um, uh, system being used by Fujitsu. I'm unsure as to what to do with this call now. Romek have been to site and state they have actually seen the phantom transactions, so it's not just the PM's word now. They have fitted suppressors to the kit, but the PM is still having problems. Okay. Uh, as yet, there have been no reoccurrence to the phantom transactions, but there still may be problems. All right. So let's, let's unpick what this all means. Romek, the uh, Royal Mail or Post Office engineers, is that correct? Yes. Yes. Um, this is referring to phantom transactions coming up on the screen. Do you agree? Yes. Right. 
Um, phantom transactions in relation to the date of this particular entry, it seems to have gone back to quite early days of legacy horizon. Do you agree? Yes. Were you aware of phantom transactions as being a problem? No. No. Do you remember speaking to uh, Colleen Ingram, we think in about 2004, about phantom or ghost transactions? No. Sorry. No. So um, help us a little bit further in relation to this. Bearing in mind that we are talking about um, phantom or ghost transactions appearing on a sub-postmaster screen, was well, this some, some information that would have been useful for your consideration in handling postmaster issues? Yes, I, I think it would be fair to say that when I left the business, I didn't accept the concept of phantom transactions, and that was in 2016. Right. Now... In your evidence earlier on, when you were discussing matters with Mr. B, Mr. Beer, you, you appeared to be familiar with the concept of phantom transaction being raised. You weren't saying to him, I don't know what you're talking about, Mr. Beer. So yeah. when did you start to become aware of the topic of phantom transactions? Um, I, I would have said my, it would be when Second Sight started their investigation, but that kind of feels a bit too late to be honest. So I've probably heard the term before, um, but I, I struggled with the, co with the concept of it. Well, Miss, Miss Ingram, who ran the uh, Cockfield Post Office in County Durham, recalls you speaking to her about ghost transactions in around 2004. 2004, mm. okay. Thinking back, do you think that's possible? I'm trying to think what role I'd be in in 2004. I guess that was in problem management, was it? Very early days of that, we think. No, look, I don't, I don't know if I was in problem management then or in the uh, the tran transaction improvement team, network improvement team. Well, if you're in the it, transaction it, it improvement team. If it helps, I think... Early on in your evidence, you referred to paragraph one of your witness statement where you suggested that you'd gone to the problem management team in 2005, but in fact there was a document which showed that you were there in 2003. Okay. So it seems likely this has been once you'd moved into the problem management. Yes. Oh, right. Mm. Do you think then looking back and looking at the collection of information you now have, that there was an awareness within the post office of phantom transactions. A client of mine who recalls speaking to you about ghost transactions, that at that time in 2004, you probably did know something about the topic of phantom transactions. I, obviously, I'd been raised, I wouldn't argue with your client's recollections. I, I don't recall it myself. Now, ask you about a different document, please. P-O-L-000. 29719. Now, this is uh, uh, an email, Mr. Uh, Wynne, from Rod Ismay. You can see the date of this. This is 3rd of July 2013. Sent to you. And the subject matter is um, branches affected by receipts, payments, and discrepancies issue. Okay, so it's a follow-on from such matters. Mm -hmm. If you go further down, you can see that it says one of two emails read the two branches on the other list. Thanks, Rod. Okay, so you're being referred then to the further information. If we just go down, um, we'll see therefore the connected email which says uh, from uh, uh, Pete Newsom to Rod Ismay. Rod, looks like this branch had a different problem, so was, a, so was removed from the original list. The email below explains what happened and how we advised uh, post office on the situation. Have an answer on second branch as well. We'll send that through shortly. And again, if we can go further down the page then to the second email headed um, from Mark Wright. And then that one from uh, Mark Wright to uh, Pete Newsom, Gareth Jenkins, uh, involving also Steve Parker, uh, Steve Bansell, and John Simpkins. 
we've unearthed the following email and then there's some figures given uh, 122946 and then go to the second page please Frankie. It's probably easiest to look at the second paragraph branch uh, 122946 rolled from TP4 to TP5 on 11th of August. They accepted a gain of uh, 34,338 which was settled centrally. The BTS shows a trading position of 22,000 £21.65. The branch was included in investigations into receipts and payments problems at the beginning of October and was found to be a different problem from the others, also under investigation at the time, so was not included in the later spreadsheet sent to poll. Mr Wynne, you've been asked various questions about what happened in the mismatch um, payments issue mm -hmm. and about the different solutions that were proposed to the mismatch difficulties and problems. You've been asked questions about whether the postmasters should have been informed that here's a problem, here's a bug that can affect um, their accounts. What happened regarding this? Did you tell postmaster branches that there's another problem, another bug that can affect your figures? I cannot remember what, what the outcome from these was. Do you recall whether there were similar discussions to perhaps keep this buried uh, and not tip off the, um, the sub-postmasters? No, I'm sorry. Do we know what the name of the branches are? See if that rings any bells with me? Not sure I do. If I have the information, I'll come back to you. OK. Next document, please. POL 40-4694, pages 1 and 2. Thank you. We are grateful. So this email dated 10th of May 2010 from Nigel Allen to you. And you'll see there reference to Barkham and then the number for appropriate for Barkham, outstanding losses. Um, so this is from Nigel Allen. Who was he? I believe he was a contract manager. Right. Andrew, to you. Andy, what is this 25,000 um, of return cash on 5th of Jan? As it's been properly recorded on the Horizon system, was it received back at the cash centre? And if we go down to the second page, please. I think a little bit further down, please. Thank you. Now, this particular branch concerns um, Pam Stubbs. Does that name ring a bell? It doesn't, I'm afraid. Ms Stubbs was blamed for a shortfall of £28,000. She lost her business and was pursued by the post office for settlement of eventually £36,000. And she had been told by Fujitsu engineers that the movement of terminals, the putting in and taking out of terminals, without proper safeguards, could cause faults. Were you aware of that? No, it doesn't, doesn't ring any bells now. Um, if we can go further down to the bottom of the, uh, this particular email, and then the starting point for the reference I'm about to make is if there is anything specific to investigate. Thank you. Now, so the email overall is saying we're aware of the problems at the branch. Um, the letter suggests she's done all the checks we and NBSC would have suggested. There is not a lot of value I can uh, add as there is nothing recorded that would account for the different losses. There are no transaction corrections that account for the losses or that should have compensated for them. She has already checked her transactional records and can see nothing. So it is unlikely that customers are going to start alerting us to strange deposits in their accounts. What may or may not be interesting is £1,000 transaction, correct, transaction correction issued recently for a cash shortage in a REM to the cash centre. One would have thought that with the issues involved, that a mistake like this would not have been made without realising. It is possible they did realise once the REM had gone, but smacks of carelessness at least. Now, that level of judgement in relation to an investigation as regards to this branch, 
which is suggesting that it's uh, careless. It, is that in the same line as your views earlier, that this is a general view of the post office, <coughs> that it's likely to be down to sub-postmaster fault where there are issues? Um, I don't think it particularly states that. And then it goes on to say this, that is there any, if there is anything specific to investigate, I'm happy to. It may be worth getting something in writing from Fujitsu to confirm that there is nothing that could have failed to poll software anonymous that will come back to bite us. Signed, Andy. Is that the right approach, Mr. Witt? It feels sensible. Does it? Well, to me, yes. What about a, d a deeper investigation as to polling issues? Well, that, that would be Fujitsu who would do that. Right. And given that this stage, this is after the um, other issues that you've been made aware of, after the uh, mismatch bug, such discussions in relation to that, you didn't think at this stage that the best thing to do would be to, in fact, properly investigate this? Um, I, I thought it was worth, obviously thought it was worth going back to Fujitsu to get a report on the polling issues, but apart from that, I couldn't see any other route for investigation. And then lastly, for my part, and I take you to another document, uh, POL three zeros nine zero seven two six. Thank you. Um, page uh, page fifteen of this document first. Thank you. We'll go for a little bit further down the page so we can see the um, see the letter at the bottom, please. Right. So we can see, Mr. Uh, Mr. Wynne, this is a letter from you to Mr. Afsel, okay? Yes. Right. So we go back to the start of this letter. And the date of it, please, we'll just show that. 11th of October, 2011. All right. Dear Mr. Afsel, re-branch discrepancy. I'm sorry to learn that your branch has experienced connectivity problems in September. I'm afraid I don't think I'm going to be able to help you. You go on to say this, some transactions will never be recoverable, e.g. stamp sales, whilst others, e.g. card accounts withdrawals, will be recoverable, dependent upon the point at which the communications broke down. I appreciate it is difficult to know where you are if communications are lost. So, Mr. Wynne, can we establish that in at least 11th of October 2011, your knowledge about connectivity problems was that it could lose data? Yes. Right. Keep reading. However, there is a general principle that if a transaction receipt has not been produced by Horizon, the transaction has not completed, and cash should not change hands until you are certain of the transaction status. Clearly, if recovery takes a period of time, the customer may have left. If the transaction is seen to be recoverable, the option not to proceed with recovery should be chosen. And then you go on to say this. Unfortunately, I am not able to offer any relief to branches who may not have followed recovery procedures in full. So this is clearly a discussion about connectivity issues that may have caused a branch uh, transaction difficulty. Yes. Do you agree? Yes. Uh, why, why here are you saying that uh, you're not able to help? I'm sorry to learn that your branch has experienced connectivity issues, connectivity problems in September. I'm afraid I don't think I'm going to be able to help you. Why is that the attitude of the post office? Um, I think the, there's a recovery, there was a recovery process to follow. Um, quite why the if, if it wasn't followed properly, it could cause cause issues. But I, I, I can't. I, that, that must have been a business decision that uh, we were unable to to resolve. I, I can't really remember it well enough, I'm afraid. Well, Mr. Wynne, let's be, let's, be, uh, let's be generous as we can to the post office at this juncture. We've got uh, um, connectivity issues uh, being caused by the system that the post office branches have to use. Okay? That's at least uh, a large part of this problem. Why isn't the post office saying, sorry to hear about that problem, obviously, this at the very least is partly our fault. We'll come and help sort it out and repay your losses. Why isn't that happening? Uh, that sounds reasonable. It does. Why wasn't it happening, Mr. Wynne? 
Uh, I can't say. We go then to the um, then page fourteen, please. So, 14th of October 2011, uh, to Mr. Afsal, uh, Ferry Road Post Office, to Mr. Afsal, Rebranch Discrepancy. Um, I'm sorry, but I don't think I can assist you any further. The process for disputing losses is via the helpline. As far as I can see, there is no evidence of Horizon failure being presented which would generate an investigation. Then, there are processes in place for branches to manage any losses of connectivity. This does not resent, represent Horizon failure, and the business has been very clear that it will not compensate losses due, it says Doe, but due to connectivity breakdown. As such, I cannot suggest who in Post Office Limited might take a different view and be able to help you. And then if we scroll down to the bottom, we'll see it signed by you. Yours sincerely, Andrew Wren. Right. So let's, let's um, have a look at what you've said then to Mr. Afsal. I'm sorry, but I don't think I can assist you any further. The process for disputing losses is via the helpline. Which helpline did you mean? Yeah, NBC. NBSC. NBSC. So via the post office helpline, that's the only way that Mr. Afsal um, should be able to dispute these matters. No, it's the designated route for IT problems, yes. Yes, OK. <laughs> then it goes on to say, or you go on to say, there are processes in place for branches to manage any losses of connectivity. This does not represent horizon failure, and the business has been very clear that it will not compensate losses due to connectivity breakdown. Right, well, let's, let's take that apart. What, what are the processes that were in place for branches to manage any losses of connectivity this way? I can't remember, but um, there, there would be on the horizon help, you'd be able to put, but once you got connectivity back, you, you could refer, refer to them if you haven't already got the knowledge of what to do. Right, but those processes clearly don't in um, the, those processes clearly don't involve compensation, do they? No. Because you you clear with that one up. This does not represent horizon failure, and the business has been very clear that it will not compensate losses due to connectivity breakdown. Well, uh, let's just understand what you mean by this. Why would the post office not compensate sub postmasters? for issues caused by connection problems of the Horizon equipment? I cannot recall what, what the, the process and how it, how it was managed. I'm well, sorry. As an example, was this a directive from the post office? The, this, I, I'm, from the word in my letter, I've obviously been, been up and checked the business position at a time and reiterated what, what I've been told. And is this you? You were talking earlier about you uh, settling into your job and getting better at it after a few years. Is this you having settled into the job and having got, gotten better at it after a few years, Mr Wynn? I, I, that, that was the, the business rules which I'm, which I'm following. Which you're enforcing? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry if the, the business rules weren't correct. Why does the connection? Why do the connection issues not represent horizon failure? I, I would regard loss of, loss of connectivity as being like losing Wi-Fi connection. The, the equivalent I, I'd understand nowadays. So I won't understand it as horizon being at fault. I'd understand as the first links, which you know a lot of rural branches did suffer from uh, connectivity issues. But I, I mean, my interpretation was that that was not horizon at fault. It might. So it's just hard luck on some postmasters. Is that right, Mr. Wynn? Well, the, there's a process. There was a process to follow to recover, recover the transactions. But to make sure that you're finished with uh, the uh, problem, you finish off by saying, as such, I cannot suggest who in post office might take a different view and be able to help you. That, so you're saying that's it. That would imply that I've checked with us with the people who I think might have a different view and, and already got their opinion. Excuse me, one moment. Thank you, Mr. Wynn. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Stephen. Anyone else? Yes, please, sir. 
If I can uh, take us to a document which helps a little bit on the subject of phantom transactions. It's poll 00093133. And this is an email chain which you're not actually copied in on, but which is, um, makes a reference to you, which may assist. Could we start at the bottom, please, um, the last page in this, so that we read up chronologically? Do you know either of these names, Bethany or Sally Buchanan? They seem to be from customer service, if that means anything to you. I can't remember them now. I may no, well have, all um, right. Well, what we've got here is um, Bethany saying, are you able to help me with this office or let me know who can help? The office had a major software problem back in week 41, January 2003. After numerous phone calls to NBSC and engineer visits to change cables, monitors, etc., a software problem was identified and the processor changed. Apparently, the screen would take on a mind of its own, jump screens, add items to the sales stack, etc. The office balanced 422.74 short that week, which is very unusual for the office. They're normally within £20 each week. The sub-postmistress has waited for an error notice to come back. Nothing has been received yet, and I've checked with Chesterfield several times, nothing so far. I've also checked the paperwork in the office for week 41, along with 40 and 42, and I can't find anything. Is there anything you can do at Dern Valley? Is that the place where your premises were when you were in yes, problem management? that's correct. To have that week's work checked on the system to see if this has been caused by a system's fault. The only other thing I can think of is that if the system was going daft and putting things onto the sales stack, this wasn't picked up every time by the person serving, and one or more customers have been given money they were not entitled to and have just kept it. So that is the start, and if we go up then to response, there's a blank page, so we need to go a little higher, thank you. Uh, and we can see that this is the 27th of the 6th, 2003, from Terry Rudd in Customer Relations. Thanks for raising this matter with us. An investigation has taken place with Julie Welsh, our contact at Fujitsu. And she accepts that the PM did call the help desk to state that transactions were appearing on the sales stack. But kit was swapped out and the problem did not reoccur. As no further problems were reported, she thought that was the end of the matter. As the losses occurred back in January, information relating to this branch has now been archived, but your concerns have today been raised with the problem management team, who have more experience in dealing with phantom transactions. I'm unsure which member of the team will be assigned to this case, but if you have any further queries, the line manager for the team is Andy Wynn. And then it sets out a reference code uh, for queries regarding this issue. Uh, and signs off, customer relations can't help, but I'm sure Andy and his team will do their best to resolve this. So uh, what we have there is an indication that phantom transactions were something sufficiently well known in your team that th this was being specifically referred to you and your team? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Which ties, doesn't it, with what Mr. Steen told us, that his, uh, his yes. core participant had spoken to somebody about phantom transactions. And so clearly this was a known problem right the way back to this early date. What um, would you have done about a query like this? Um, I would have allocated it to a team member to raise it uh, with Fujitsu. And what sort of response might you have got from Fujitsu? Um, a, a, a review of their... I, I don't really know what, the, what they would have done there. I would have hoped they'd have looked at the... identified the times and looked to see if there's any problems arising from there and reported them back to us. So, following that report, let's say they come back to you and they say, yes, we've identified there are phantom transactions in this particular branch or in this particular group of branches, potentially, what would your team have done about that? Um, well, we'd have, we'd have escalated it um, and to probably to our IT team and, and said what we're going to do about it, how we're going to resolve it. And what would you have done in terms of the branches? Um, re resolved any financial accounting discrepancies. How did you go about that? That would have been done through PMBA, or so, whatever it was called at that time. So there'd have been quite a lot of communication, wouldn't there, between your team 
and uh, people at Fujitsu, people in uh, PMBA, people have in so, yes. uh, the groups, the, the the poll or perhaps the group at that stage, IT directorate, was it one or the other, do you know? Um, oh, I wouldn't know. Did your team escalate the issue of phantom transactions? I would have thought so. From, I, I presume that that was raised to, to our team. I, can, I cannot remember it. And do you have no memory of escalating this issue of phantom transactions when you were the team leader at this time? No. Wouldn't it have been a matter of concern to you? Yes. Wouldn't it have been a matter of great concern to the business generally? I, I don't know how e easily it was what, what, the, what the Fujitsu findings were. Okay, sorry, I, I can't, can't comment. If Fujitsu had come back and said no such thing, there's no phantom transactions, it doesn't exist, would you have left it there? I don't know where else I could have gone. So yes, I think I would have. So never mind that uh, your team evidently has, um, according to this email, more experience in dealing with phantom transactions. Never mind that this isn't just a one-off. This is clearly something that's happened on a few occasions. You would have just taken Fujitsu's word. I wouldn't have known where else to, to go. You wouldn't have taken it to anyone in IT at Pol? If, if it was a... Uh, yes, quite possibly. I, I, I would have imagined that the inquiry would have gone to Fujitsu and our IT teams. When you were at problem management, um, what was the directorate that your team sat in? I would imagine the IT director. I can't actually remember. So you don't know who the director was in charge of problem management? You don't know who it was above your team leader or your boss or whoever that may have been? No, I can't, can't remember. You gave us the name of one of your bosses earlier, didn't you? Do you remember what she was the boss of? Marie Cockett? Yeah, that was when I was in Chesterfield at the process improvement team. Uh, I think you gave us a name for somebody at... Um... Actually, she, I think she was my boss in problem management as well. Right. Uh, initially. And so that was something in accounting, was it? I think she moved as, as well. I think she moved from the accountants, from the process improvement team into the same kind of t team areas as I was in within problem management, if I remember correctly. Have you listened to the evidence from witnesses over the last week or so? No. Because collectively they've given evidence that problem management really was the way that post office monitored the performance of Horizon and indeed the performance of Fujitsu in running and maintaining the performance of Horizon. Is that, is that how you understood the role? Um, no, not really. Well, what did you understand it to be then? Um, to be re resolving problems, making sure the appropriate people were resolving problems. I, I don't think there was a particularly reporting schedule. I, I don't remember that coming out of problem management when I was there. Was this the business as usual way to resolve bugs, errors and defects that arose in Horizon? Um, it, it, was, it was the way it should be re, uh, recorded, yes. Uh, and we know that by 2010, and I'm, I'm, I'm only going forward just to kind of come back, if you like, by 2010, it was people in problem management that were the interface with Fujitsu over the receipts and payments mismatch bug, weren't they? Yes. And so that was the role, was to be the interface on bugs and defects yes. and so forth, yes? So it was a crucial IT role, wasn't it? Yes. What interested you in that role when you applied to manage that team? Uh, to be brutally honest, the promotion. What grade were you as a manager of that team of 12? CM1. TM1. CM1. CM1. And, and where did that place you in the, the grades at the time? Um, th that was the highest grade of middle manager before you became a senior manager. And from there, so there's different grades of senior manager and then director at level. 
How busy was your team of 12? Um, I would say the team were not desperately busy and I was very busy. Right. Perhaps you can pull that apart for us. Why were you busy and they weren't? The, there were plenty of problems coming in. The problem with my, in my opinion, the problem management setup was that if effectively a, a, a member of the product team, which is nothing to do with IT, but a guy from the product team who I knew very well said to me, you know, we're told to report any problems into your team. You make a note of it, say thanks very much, let us know when you've resolved it. Which kind of, so the, the team, uh, bear in mind about 12 people, seemed really to be employed just to record something and wait for it to to be told it was cleared. So there's, when you went across the team, how are you doing on this one? Well, I'm waiting. It was always, I'm waiting for, I'm waiting for, I'm waiting for. And it was kind of, well, can, can you chase them, et cetera, et cetera. It, it didn't seem to, I was quite uncomfortable with that. I kind of expected it to be much more proactive. And I'd, I'd say to the teams, look, you know, we need an article to resolve a product issue. Well, they, they, aren't, they haven't got time to do it. Well, have a go at doing it yourself. Submit it to them, and they'll probably be that horrified at what you're doing. They'll do it themselves to make it. And I was trying to work on, on that basis of being more proactive. On the IT side, we wouldn't be able to because we wouldn't have had the knowledge, obviously. But I, I found it a difficult role. Yes, and, and one that you've already admitted you weren't really qualified for. Correct. Um, given that it was a role that was crucial to uh, the handling of defects, bugs, errors, and that that's central to the work of this inquiry, why didn't you say anything about it in your witness statement? I, well, I did make reference to it. Why did the team get taken over by risk, as you um, described to us earlier? Um, a, a routine business as usual review of the departments as a whole. Um, it wasn't my decision, but um, pre there was... There was kind of a lot, lot of change and it was decided to merge the two teams together. They were quite similar similar in the uh, un understanding, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, uh, I could understand why it was done. Was there any strategic thinking at all about the business as usual management of problems, defects, bugs in Horizon? Not that I was made aware of, no. And just lastly on this topic, um, what we have here, the one uh, remaining, as far as we can tell, document from this period of time when you were team leader of this crucial team that had to interface on bugs, errors and defects, is one email from a different team, customer relations. We have no emails from problem management itself, no records at all from your time at problem management and nothing at all about the problem of phantom or ghost transactions, which apparently your team knew about. Can you give us any understanding or explanation for why there's so little information about your team at that time? No, I'm, I'm surprised. There was, um, it, 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 as far as I'm aware, everything that we did was logged, so I, I'm quite astonished that you're saying that. Can we perhaps turn then a little ahead to poll three zeros four five four five seven? Now this is a document which seeks to define the process of settling centrally. Mm -hmm. And it says at the bottom that it's uh, been a contribution from you, so it looks perhaps as if it might be something that's to go into a manual or something. Does that look familiar? Yes, yes. Um, 
if we just go back up again, it looks to be a, a, a clarification, expressed explicitly as a clarification. Yes. And um, it says a recent audit has highlighted that many branches are unclear on how to deal with losses and gains, particularly around settling centrally. Do you think that audit might have been what you did before you did those slides in January 2009? Uh, I wouldn't have done the audit, I don't think. I think that would have been feedback from network auditors out right. in branches. Um, the reason I ask is because one of the slides um, had that you'd, you'd created in January 2009 sort of set the task of defining the process of settling centrally, mm -hmm. and this document appears to do that. Yes. So do you think this document comes then from that process in January 2009? Quite, quite possibly without knowing the date of the document. The document uh, uh, doesn't appear to bear a date in it. That, it sounds sensible. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, let's, let's assume then that it's part of that January 2009 reappraisal, shall we say. Um, when we asked our clients, sub-postmasters, um, who had experience of running post offices before January 2009, um, when we asked them to have a look at this, none of them recognised this process at all. And indeed, um, Janet Skinner said that she was not aware that there was any dispute resolution process whatsoever. Is it right that prior to January 2009, there really wasn't a recognised dispute process at all? If, well, prior to me starting the role, yes. then that would be correct, yes. Yeah. Um, so, do you know why that role um, came up? Um, I, I think... Um, when when I was to say we had a reorganisation in in PMBA and the different teams were created, and I went into the debt debt team, and my boss Allison said, look, we we've got people trying to contact teams and what, and they're not respond, res, responding to them. We need a central point. We think it should be you. Have a, have a look at it, and so the rule kind of evolved from from there. Was this a, um, a, a, a you, you told us earlier that you didn't have to apply or interview for this job. Was it a, a, a job that was, in effect, one that, that you sort of created yourself once in it? Yes. Yes, I think when I, when I first got there, Alison and Rod Ismay's view had some ideas about the role, but effectively it was me who kind of developed it to what, to what it was. At this stage, were you still a sort of top middle management, or had you entered the realms of senior management by this stage? No, st still the same grade. Um, why do you think you were qualified to adjudicate on disputes? Um, I don't think I was particularly qualified, but I probably felt that it was the role that I was best suited to in all my working within the whole Royal Mail group. Why? Um, because I, I, I think I in, investigated things and was prepared to look, look outside the box, and I had a bit of empathy with the postmaster, I think. Um, do you still think that, having looked back at some of your correspondence? I'm disappointed with some of the things I, I wrote, yes. Can we um, just, we can take that document down and before I um, turn to another one, I'd just like to uh, ask you a little bit about Mr. Lee Castleton. Is that a name that rings any bells for you? Yes. Did you know about his case at the time? Um, I think his case was, I, I, th I think his case was very topical when I first joined the team. Right. So it'd be very much in the, in the early days. I don't think I was involved in any of the decisions around su suspension or anything. But it was, it was known about, was it, in yes. your team? Quite, yes. quite well known. Yes. All right. So um, 
you'll have been aware then, won't you, that um, in, you won't necessarily remember the date, but it was in uh, early 2007 that the judge awarded post office damages of approximately £26,000, but costs of £321,000, uh, which you might imagine bankrupted Mr Castleton. Uh, he lost everything he'd invested in his branch. He lost his living. His family were treated like thieves. And uh, they endured years of hardship. Um, and what we now know from documents in this inquiry, which uh, haven't yet been, been sort of picked over, but which I can uh, quote to you briefly from, I don't know if we necessarily need to put it on the screen, is um, that there was a clear intent on the part of the post office with legal advice to pursue the claim, quotes, not to make a net financial recovery, but to defend the horizon system and hopefully send a clear message to other SPMs that the PO will take a firm line and deter others from raising similar allegations. So that was the purpose. It was not ever envisaged that the post office would actually get that costs order back. That was a loss leader, if you like. But the purpose was to send a firm line and a clear message to deter others. Now, is that how the case was understood at the time? Is that something that your team would have been aware of, that it was a sort of a flagship case, if you like, to try to deter others? Um, no, I don't think so. I was conscious that it was, it was probably the most high-profile case at that time, but I, I don't think I would have picked up that, that message. The, um, we can also see from uh, documentation that the lawyers in charge of the case were also conscious of other cases, including well, one which you... Hang on a minute. Do you have any direct knowledge of Mr. Castleton's case at all, Mr. Wynne? No, I don't. Well, I, I mean, I'm conscious that this is a very sensitive case, Miss Flora, obviously, uh, Miss Page, obviously, but um, I don't think it's appropriate to use the witness just for you to read extracts of other documents. I, I was just about to come to the documents which he is involved with, um, sir, so I, I hope that's... Yeah, that, that's fine. That was a scene setting, if you, if you like. Um, the, the related case, if you like, which you were involved with, was a Mr Bilku. Does that ring any bells? No. So Mr Bilku um, uh, issued a claim against Paul, but then withdrew it um, because uh, the, the, he was threatened with costs of instructing an expert in the region of a million pounds, and he told you about that. Do you remember? No. Well, we can perhaps then have a look at poll uh, 401304 at page 29, bottom of the page. Uh, this is from him to you. Uh, sorry, we could perhaps go up to the top of the page just so that you can see that. Um, he was writing from Bowburn Post Office, and you can see there at the top, Dear Mr Wynne, I've obviously misspelt your name, but um, the correspondence shows that uh, he had written to you, and this was part of a bit of a, a back and forth between the two of you. There's one thing that I'd, I'd like to just ask you about before we go to the bottom. Um, we see their reference to, uh, he says, your letter is a repeat of previous letters sent and is similar in style to those I've received from Michelle Graves and Philippa Wright, brackets, flag case managers for Adam Crozier, Alan Cook. Um, do you know what a flag case manager was? No. And do you know those names? Um... Alan Crozier and Alan Cook, yes, the, the two ladies now. I, I, mm, I can't remember them. 
And, and what about the two gentlemen? They were um, heads. heads they, were, they were seniors, the, yeah? The, and well, so they were the, the executive directors. And so you don't recall what the, the flag case managers did for them? No. Well, if we go a bit further down, we see that uh, Mr. Bilku tells you Um, in summary, it, it, it says, Paul may consider the matter closed, that's his complaint, but I do not. According to my legal team, the case can be resumed subject to legal niceties. In summary, the case was withdrawn, he's talking about his case, because Paul's legal team demanded that Horizon Accounts at Bowburn Post Office for the last four years be examined by a forensic accountant. The cost estimated at a million pounds, be borne by me. Um, does that, reading that letter, does that not ring any bells? No, sorry. The idea that the legal department would threaten somebody with costs estimated at a million pounds? Um, no. Looking back, do you think this is part of a, a, of a culture of, of sort of using legal process to threaten sub postmasters? Uh, that's quite possible, yes. Is that perhaps part of the, the sort of setting of what we've seen in your own correspondence of this sort of um, putting the burden of proof on the sub postmasters of... No, I don't think so. ...using the law against them? No, I don't think I've ever threatened anything like, like that. I've, I've tried to, where, where I could see a way of investigating and helping, I've tried to do that. Um, some very brief questions, if I may, on the uh, document which we've looked at quite a lot, the Receipts and Payments Mismatch Meeting. Um, I just want to look at the first page of it again, if I may. It's poll three zeros two double eight three eight. And if we just look at those um, post office names, who would you say was the most senior person there? Who was Ian Trundle? Although Alan Simpson, I don't know what grade he was at. Ian Trundle and Alan. Sorry, did you say Alan Simpson? Alan Simpson, all right. Well, I'm 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 guessing there. I don't know, actually know what grade any anyone was was at. But your first reaction was that those were the two senior people at the meeting. Yes. Who would you have reported back to about this? Presumably, Mr. Ismay. Yes. And did you report back to Mr. Ismay about this bug? Um, I'm I'm sh whether I. Talk directly to Mr. Ismay or uh, Mrs. Mrs. Bolzover. I'm not, not certain, but I would have certainly fed back in as part of, part of normal communications. Thank you. The document can be taken down. So you're saying that you would have reported back to Mr. Ismay and Miss Bolsover. Is that right? Yes. And there's just two more issues that I'd like to look at, so if I may. If... Uh, is anyone else intending to ask questions? So no, they're not. Fine. Off you go then. Thank five you. Minutes. Oh, five minutes, Miss Page. Thank you. Um, if I can look then, please, at poll two zeros one zero five two eight zero. And if we could look at um, page three, and uh, I won't take you through the whole history up to page three. Page three sort of dives in. This is in the summer of 2013. Uh, so this is post receipts and payments mismatch bug, and around the time when um, Second Sight's work is, is pretty well known within the post office, yeah? 
uh, and you're asking a contracts manager, this is a discussion with a contracts manager having been in touch with a branch about a loss that dates back 10 years. And this is your uh, putting three possibilities for how to deal with it to the contracts manager. And you say, hi, Nigel, I don't actually disbelieve the branch here, but the claim that two sets of auditors have recorded missing stock as being present is a bit scary. Stamps are just pieces of paper at Swindon, so they would not have been a surplus at another branch. I can see three options. Pay up, we don't believe you. Create a phantom rem out, branches can now invent 10-year-old errors that we have to let them off on because we do not have any information about. Plus, Swindon will not pick up a phantom rem, so I can rem stamps out and just sell them on my retail side. I think that seems to be a, a suggestion that you're making for a way to sort of balance it off. Is that, is that how I should read that? Uh, um, yeah, that, that's how it, how it could have done, been done remotely, yeah. Yeah, and then network write-off. We believe you, and we're making a gesture in recognition of long years of accurate accounting, and his TC rate is excellent. However, this does leave huge question marks over the audit process. None are particularly appealing. Thoughts? Question mark. Um, well, first of all, it's a bit striking, isn't it, that one of the options you're putting forward is we don't believe you when you've actually said at the start of the email, I don't actually disbelieve the branch here. I think... Um what, I, what I'm trying to do there is make the first two look at what they were, totally unappealing options, and the third one is where, where we're going. Well, the third one is indeed where you go. Yeah. If we go up to the next um, uh, response, though, page two, what's quite interesting is that the response from the network manager says in paragraph three here, as you say, none of the options are particularly appealing. I think the first option, making the SPMR pay up, could open up a can of worms. I'm not sure that the SPMR is a member of the NFSP, but given that the amount involved represents a significant percentage of his salary, I feel sure he would take this further. This could put us in the position of trying to defend ourselves against a charge that the auditors didn't do their job properly and could potentially give the NFSP or an MP some useful ammunition. So it's again this idea, really, isn't it, that... It, it's about the ammunition, it's about MPs, it's, it's not really about doing the right thing. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think we're aiming to do the right thing. Well, you did do the right thing, but rather than just doing the right thing, you're discounting other options, not on the grounds that they're wrong or because you actually believe the branch, but because it could potentially give the NFSP or an MP some useful ammunition. Um, and I think that would be true if we were saying that two sets of audits were both incorrect. That's not the kind of thing you, you'd want to ad ad advertise, particularly when you don't know if that's the case. Well, you do know it's the case. That's the investigation. That's what's happened. Well, well no, we don't. That, that was the problem with this case, that it could understand what the, what the guy was saying, but he's saying that two sets of auditors have come in audited the branch, he said, there's an issue with these, which he's going to get needs resolving. So the auditors uh, said, OK, we'll, we'll, we'll assume that they're there. If they weren't there, I mean, that's what an auditor's job is to identify discrepancies. So for two of them to go in and not, they would suggest that any, any audit cannot be relied upon. So although you believe the, the, the SPMR, I, 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 don't dis, I don't disbelieve the postmaster, but I don't believe that two auditors have not done the job properly. So I'm left a little bit. I don't know, don't know where we are anyway. All right. Well, just one, one last, um, if I may, because this brings us up a little bit more to date, and it's um, poll 3092640, and this dates from 2015. This seems to um, relate to what we've come to understand were weekly horizon meetings. These were regular calls, is that right, with lawyers involved as well, people from the security team. Do you remember a weekly horizon meeting being instituted 
in around 2013 and carrying on for some time, apparently? Um, I, I don't particularly remember it being a, a weekly meeting, but I accept that it, it, it could have been. You do remember the Horizon meetings, do you? I remember being on Horizon meetings, whether I was on the weekly weekly ones or not, I'm not, not certain. Well, certainly in relation to this one, um, it's, uh, it's referring to one that's taken place in August of 2015. And it says, as you will see, there were numerous issues raised on the last call which are of concern. First of all, it says Andy Wynne is still receiving requests to authorise FJ to correct problems. Presumably that's Fujitsu. Mm -hmm. um, and what I understand that to mean, and you correct me if I'm wrong, is that that's Fujitsu asking to go into Horizon to correct problems and you're authorising them to do so. Is that what's going on there? Is that the process? Um, I'm, I'm not sure what Fujitsu wanted to do, but yes, it's we're asking me to authorise them to, to do something. I, I don't know what from here. Well, we've got two, uh, we've actually got three issues that come up. The first one is that they ask to do this when kit is removed from branches, which can cause issues. And then secondly, there's the discontinued sessions issue, which has gone on to explain further. And it talks about two new products uh, which cause the system to disconnect and recovery scripts are failing. So these are two different things which seemingly they're having to go into the system to correct and you're having to sign off on the process. Is that something you recall doing? Um, I, I would imagine I could see myself being the voice that would give Paul approval, yes, if yep. that makes sense. It says in the latter part of that um, paragraph, um, this is apparently standard business as usual, and FJ seek authorization to correct it. It is unclear at the present time whether or not there is process assurance and documentation. I do not know whether Paul have full visibility of the actions of Fujitsu and the ways in which they correct the branch data. Does that ring a bell? It doesn't, it doesn't ring a bell, but it makes sense to, to me. That there wasn't really a process that was being followed? Um, that I was visible. I think I possibly naively assumed that the IT department were the ones who would be kind of joined, joined up with that. But certainly, as far as I was concerned, that, that wouldn't be the case. All right. And then the paragraph below, just to finish off on this. Um, Andy Wynn also raised the issue of a computer problem with Camelot for which a fix had been issued but pointed out that branches would encounter unexplained losses that Wednesday when they conducted their BTS procedure. He went on to explain that he'd received an email from Fujitsu about an incident which had occurred in June. It was termed a major incident report and related to a branch which had an incorrect discrepancy at the time of conducting a branch trading statement. The email suggested that information had been sent to Paul. Andy Wynn had not previously known about this issue and so asked to whom the information had been sent. He had no response. Andy went on to say that he did not fully understand the issue and that a maximum of 247 branches would have been affected. 118 of those would have generated reports based on corrupted data. There was only one accounting connection with which Paul could have held someone responsible for the shortfall. So in 2015, following the receipts and payments mismatch bug, following the fact that um, Second Sight have become involved, um, following the fact that that means that it became apparent that the receipts and payments mismatch bug still hadn't been followed up properly, you're still having problems, aren't you, at Poll, with actually getting on top of and dealing with bugs that affect corrupted data. Yeah. Is this a receipts and payments finish match issue? I don't believe it is. I, I believe it seems to be a different issue. Yeah. But this is, this is evidence, is it not, that Paul and Fujitsu are still not working through proper procedures? That yes, I think so, yeah. Yeah. All right. Then you can end on a high note, uh, Ms. Page. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Is that it, Mr. Beer? Yes, yeah, sir. That concludes the questioning of Mr. Wynne. Thank you, Mr. Wynne, for coming to give evidence. It's been a long day, clearly. Certainly has. Uh, but I'm grateful for you to, that you came. 
to, to give the answers to very many questions. I thank hope you. I could be some help. Thank you. So thank well, you. I think that's yeah. um, us done now until um, Tuesday the 7th of March when we um, will hear evidence from Liz Evans-Jones. Yeah, all right. Thanks very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you.